Now, this week is interesting because we don't have one parsha, we have two parshas. And the reason for that is a little bit complex, but the Torah is broken up into 54 parshas, sections. And that corresponds to how many weeks you have to have, typically, to have one week per parsha. Now, the thing is, is that we sometimes have longer years. The Jewish calendar could be anywhere from 354 days to 385 days. That's because uh, every three years or so, we have an extra month, extra month of Adar, to compensate for the fact that a lunar month is a day and a half shorter than a solar month, if you were to divide the solar year into 12, into 12 months. And therefore, we have more Parshas than necessary on a regular year, typical year like this year, we don't have an extra month, we have four or so extra Parshas that are not attributed to a week, and therefore, certain weeks, we have two Parshas together that we finish the entire Torah over the whole year. Okay, so the first one is Vayakel, and Vayakel means, and he assembled. And essentially, these two Parshas are going to be mirror images of Teruma and Tetzava. So the past um, couple of weeks, we had Teruma, Parshas Teruma, and then Teruma told us the instructions given to Moshe to build the tabernacle and all the walls and all the vessels, so almost all the vessels. The following week, we had Tetzave, another in, uh, set of instructions given to Moshe to build all, or to create all the vestments of the high priest. And then in the intermediate last week, we had Kisisa, which had a little bit left over of the building of the tabernacle, and then it had the whole episode of the golden calf, and its aftermath, and finally the Jewish people being given another set of tablets, and being granted forgiveness. And this week we have the implementation of those two parshas, the implementation of, of, of Teruma to build the tabernacle and all the vessels in the tabernacle, and the implementation of the Sava in the, in the last Parsha Pekude, which is the implementation of the, uh, of, of Parsha's Tetzave and building and, uh, assembling the vestments of the high priest. Uh, so it's, it's very, it seems very repetitive. And of course, that's one of the fundamental questions is what's the, what's the lesson? Like we could have quite simply said the Torah is very careful. What, what, it doesn't say anything extra. It could have just said, and Moshe, and his people, and his helpers, and Betzalel, and all the cohorts, all of them did everything that we already talked about. But the Torah d- determined that, no, we have to go through the details of everything that it actually did. I think one of the interesting themes of the Parsha is the fact that, yes, there's the instructions to do it, and the implementation mirrors it, but in the middle we have the golden calf. So it's almost as if the Torah decided to take that episode of the golden calf and bury it between a whole larger discussion, five parshas long, about the tabernacle. And typically, uh, one of the themes of the tabernacle is that it is going to be a, uh, a, a way of g- being granted forgiveness for that sin. And uh, one of the commentaries, in fact, posits that had the Jewish people not sinned in the golden calf, we wouldn't have had the tabernacle. And everything that's in the tabernacle is there to fix all the problems that we did with the golden calf. And it goes to, of course, a very granular detail. And therefore, it, it, it has a whole story about the tabernacle, and in the middle, it puts in the story of the, of the golden calf. So first of all, it gets kind of swallowed into the surrounding environments, uh, but also... Uh, it demonstrates the connection and the fact that this is going to rectify the sins that we did in the golden calf that we spoke about last week. Now, so what does it start off? It starts off with telling us that these are the things that they might have instructed uh, Moshe to tell the Jewish people to do. He gathers them all in, and the first thing he tells them to, about the tabernacle is that we don't work on Shabbos to build the tabernacle. Six days you do your work, on the seventh day, is holy, is distinct, it's Shabbos for God, no one does any work in it, whoever does work in it is put to death, and don't make any fires on Shabbos. And that's the introduction, because 
uh, to tell us that everything that you need to do for the Mishnah, the actual implementation of the Mishkan, that cannot be done on Shabbos. It doesn't override Shabbos. And the lesson here is that Shabbos overrides the building of the Mishkan. So, for example, uh, if we today somehow were granted the uh, political and religious inspiration to build the temple in, in Jerusalem, which is a mitzvah, uh, we wouldn't be allowed to do the construction on Shabbos. We'd have to say, okay, we'll take the Shabbos off and we'll start it on Sunday or after Shabbos. Um, and the, the, the interesting question I want to ask is, normally, when we're told that something is not allowed, the Torah goes out of its way and says, well, don't build the tabernacle on Shabbos. But that implies that had we not had the verse telling us not to do it, we would have thought to do it. Absent the verse, you would have thought, well, maybe you should build a tabernacle on Shabbos. Well, we already know, we've seen it prior, that you're not allowed to work on Shabbos, and all these, wor- all, all these activities are work that you're doing on Shabbos. So why would you have thought that, absent the verse, had we not been told that you're not allowed to do it, that you will be allowed to do it? So, my grandfather suggested that this does demonstrate how, or this instruction, or this, uh, this prohibition of building the tabernacle on Shabbos is echoing what happened with the golden calf. The golden calf, it was really guided with the best intentions. The people felt leaderless, they felt rudderless, they, they needed Moshe, they were convinced Moshe's not coming back. And in their mind, it was logical to try to find alternatives. And you know what? That's not a bad argument. Uh, but the problem is that the method that they used, or the path that they took to get to their mitzvah, was one that was a path of sin. And the critical error, and the Ramban himself says this, the error, it wasn't that they had this day they wanted to do idolatry. They wanted to do a mitzvah. But they used idolatry or idolatrous kind of activities and in practices in order to get to their mitzvah. Critical core problem was that they use an idolatrous path towards what their mitzvah was. And here we're told the first, very first thing is you have to realize you want to do mitzvahs. You want to build a tabernacle. It's a great mitzvah. It's a mitzvah that's going to bring God into our midst. You have to realize that you have to now, you have to do it not the same way you tried to do the previous mitzvah. You have to now avoid sinning on your path towards the mitzvah. And that, and indeed, the reason why they would have thought to do that is because that's how they just behaved in the previous parsha. In the previous parsha, they tried to do a mitzvah, and they used the sin to get there. Well, Moshe's telling them, make sure you don't make the same mistake now. We're trying to fix what you guys did. Don't do the same mistake. And I think, broadly speaking, that uh, uh, there, 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 is a, there is a concept, um, religious fervor, that sometimes flares up where people are so committed to their religious desires and motivations that sometimes they, hey, they do that via a sin. There's a famous story with Rabbi Israel Salanter, who was, we talk about this a lot. He would say, you're doing a mitzvah, why do I have to suffer? Yeah. There was a famous story where someone uh, was putting on his talus in shul, and he was so absorbed with the mitzvah and he was wrapping himself with the talus that the little strains of the talus, the little tzitzis, was whipped uh, the person behind him, Rabbi Salanter. And he would say to him, like, you want to do a mitzvah, but why do I have to suffer? And, and sometimes people get caught up in their own little environment, and they want to do good. They want to do good. But good that comes with the sin, well, that's, that's not okay. Uh, you know, that's the way of the Almighty, is, is, you know, the way of the Torah is with pleasantness. And plus, this doesn't mean where you get so caught up into your mitzvah that you're whipping someone uh, with, with your sin. And of course, there's many, many examples of this idea. But I think from the get-go, we're being uh, instructed here that the mitzvah of building the mishkan, which it's very, very important, but it doesn't override Shabbos, it does seem to be uh, teaching us this lesson. So Moshe tells Gazel, the Jewish people, and tells them, all the things that they need to donate. It gives the whole list, the same list that we had previously. So he asks for material donations, and then he asks for talent. 
he wants people who are wise to come and help contribute to build the tabernacle, the tent, the cover, the hooks, the planes. The whole, it goes through the whole list of the things that we need to make. The menorah, the cover, the partition, the utensils. We're going to need a lot of really talented craftsmen and artisans to help build this. So he lists in verses, uh, verses 11 through 19, he lists all the things that we need to now build. And he's calling out for volunteers who wants to come and contribute. And that's the announcement that he made. This is the plan. Every he gathers all the Jewish people, and that's what we need to do. First, we need donations. Then we need um, skilled laborers to help contribute to this holy cause. And then verse 21 tells us, Every man whose heart inspired him, who had wisdom, internal wisdom, and everyone whose spirit motivated him brought the portion of Hashem for the work and for its labor. So both the people responded, both with the material requests that Moshe had, and also with the requests for talent, for, for contributions of steel. Now, the, the sources here, the commentaries, they talk about the fact that these people were slaves just until very, very recently. It's been about a half year since the Jewish people left. Uh, the Jewish people left, just chronologically, they left Egypt, 50 days later, they got the Ten Commandments at Sinai. 40 days later, Moshe comes down. The people are doing the, uh, the, uh, the golden calf. He goes back up a second time to try to garner uh, um, forgiveness, for the atonement for the Jewish people. And uh, then he comes back down, and then he gets the final instruction in last week's parasha to make yet a second set of tablets to go up a third time. And he arrives down on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, he gets the final instruction, I have forgiven as you has, have requested. And that's why, by the way, our Yom Kippurs are on the same day when the greatest amount of atonement ever was given, where the entire nation, they, God said, I'm going to destroy the entire nation. And then on Yom Kippur is when the big turnaround happened, where, her, where the Almighty finally says, I'm, I'm forgiving them exactly the way Moshe had requested. And the following day, he comes back, and they start preparing and planning for the Mishkan. So it's been a half a year, but a half a year ago, they were all slaves. And you don't imagine there are a lot of uh, artisans of gold and silver and intricate embroidery. And the, the commentators all puzzle over the question, where did these people, where did this know-how come from? Take people that are used to working with their hands and abrasive work, and suddenly to deal with very delicate matters, to take huge blocks of gold and hew out of them very intricate uh, designs, it's not its not something you would typically imagine. The Ramban says that they did not do these work in Egypt, like Basala and Aliyah. They didn't do this actual work in Egypt, but each one of them found some internal inspiration. And they, they just jumped into the task and they just found some sort of fountain of inspiration to do that. And uh, the obvious question is, if someone isn't, how is it possible for someone who's not trained in a certain manner to just jump into it and to be good at it? That, that's the question. And one of the answers given is that we all have, like, unknown talents. And sometimes until we're forced to have to just do it and we just jump in and we say, I'm not ready, but I'm doing it anyhow. We don't know that we have those abilities. And those people, yes, they had worked in the farms and they had worked in the brick lane and they never knew that they were very gifted in, in, in all these intricate crafts until they just did it and they inspired and they just managed to do it. And I think to us, it's, we, we're used to being very limited, you know, we say, this is what I could do, this is what I can't do. But if I was forced to do that, could I not do it and excel at it? The answer is probably yes, just sometimes we're scared. We're scared of doing things that we're not sure precisely how to do it. I'll tell you a story that happened with me. I'm still not sure I know how to do it, but um, it was like four years ago, we had, it was the Monday before Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was on a, was on a Shabbos, and uh, and it was Monday, so like four or five days beforehand. And the Gabbai of our shul 
he comes to me and it's like, we don't really have someone to lead the services in Kippur. Could you do it? And in it split with I said yes, even I've never done it before. And it's it's a very long prayer, and there's lots of singing and lots of different tunes, and there's all different melodies and all that. And I just said I'll do it. And I don't know why I did it, but I I just did it. And it wasn't great the first year, but now I've done it every year since, and I got I got okay at it. And if I if I hadn't just said I'll do it, I probably wouldn't have known that I could do it. Maybe it wasn't great from the get go. But I was serviceable, and then I got better, and I got good at it. You know, and I remember, I remember like just in a, just this is just me personally. Um, when I got to Houston five years ago around, so I started giving classes, and I would like, I would worry, oh my gosh, I got to give a class, it's, it's an hour long, what if I don't know what to say? I would prepare, and really prepare, and be all sweaty and all nervous, and... And now it's been, I don't know, I've gotten, given probably more than 500 different talks, hour-long talks, and I just got good at it. And who knows how many other things personally, but everyone, are things that we just never were forced into doing yet, and we never realized that we're kind of okay at it. And you know what? It's, it's, you just, you just jump in, and you'll figure it out along the way, and the Almighty has a certain basket of, of, of capabilities that he reserves for those that are ambitious and those that jump into task. Uh, the story goes with um, Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz. He was my grandfather's rabbi teacher. And he was one of the most prolific and genius Torah teachers of the past hundred years. But I read a story about him that before he was nominated for his post, he was worried that he's going to get up to give a lecture and he's not going to know what to say. Which is so hilarious thinking about post facto and how much voluminous, insightful writings and lectures he would give and he had given. It's unbelievable the, the, the copious amounts of information with brilliant ideas that he has done it over, he did over his his career. Yet at the beginning he was nervous. He didn't know if he would do it. Which it's funny because we see obvious capabilities. But sometimes the capabilities only come, you only realize the capabilities are there once you're there, once you're forced into doing it. And you're forced into doing it and you see that you have all this potential. The Almighty created us with like a soul. It's unbelievable what we have. But this soul is un, it's, it's unimagined. Like any, any limitations we put on us, it's only from our body's perspective. The soul has no limits. So we all have it within us. It's just sometimes it takes circumstances or gumption for someone to just say, I'm doing it, whatever it may be. And you know what? They'll do it. And they probably will excel at it. And it might not be great at the beginning, but they'll get good at it. And we see here, these people, they wouldn't, if you would look at them, you would say, this guy's not cut out. You know, he didn't go to the proper schools and he didn't go to the proper trade schools. And he doesn't look so delicate, and he doesn't know all the all, all, all the fancy terminology, the parlance of the craft. He's not wearing the right kind of hat for like the glass blowers. And the truth is, these people were were, were talented, and they chose the Almighty helps that helped them, and they had uh, uncovered abilities they didn't even know that they uh, had within them. Okay, so everyone comes, they all contribute, um, all the wool the linen, the goat here, all the skins that are needed for the various covers, uh, copper and silver and wood, everyone contributed, the men, the women, everyone was involved. And then in verse 27 here it says, the leaders, the Nisim, the heads of every tribe, they brought the very expensive shoham stones for the aphod and for the breastplates. Uh, in the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, uh, and then the apron, the apron like, he, uh, he had two stones on top, so the 14 very precious stones, two on the shoulders of the Kohen of Aaron, and 12 on the breastplate. And it says that the Nisim, the, uh, the leaders of the tribes, they contributed those. And there's an interesting reason why they contributed those specifically, why the Torah does mention that, because these people, they delayed. They said they were the, they were the leaders, they were very rich, and they said, you know what, we're not going to go jump ahead and donate some gold or silver 
we'll wait to see what everyone else doesn't do and we'll fill in the gaps. That was their plan initially. And when people started giving and giving and giving and everything was covered. And the Nassim are called out for it. Why did you wait to say, I'll, no, when, when, there's a, when there's an effort to go build the Mishkan, you jump ahead. You don't say, I'll wait till the end. You jump ahead right at the beginning. And that's why uh, over here, all, the only thing that was left are these stones. And they quickly said, let, let us give those stones, even though they're very expensive. We don't want to be the only ones who didn't give. doesn't look very good. Okay, so they, so they have the stones and all the spices. It goes through a whole list again. Every man and woman who were inspired and motivated to do the work, they all came forth and contributed. And the Torah goes through here, just one after another. Um, we have Betzalel, he's going to be, he's going to headline the project. His lieutenant is going to be Ahaliyav from the tribe of Don, very skilled in all manners of weaving and carving and crafting. And they get the instruction to do it and they start working. And they make the curtains, the very intricate curtains that are going to cover ten curtains, they're going to cover the tabernacle, they're going to make the wood, the vertical woods, the planks that are going to uh, comprise the walls of the tabernacle. And it goes through the exact measurements and everything that we've seen already previously. Planks, 20 planks, each one a, a cubit and a half long, and then silver sockets on the bottom as well uh, to hold it because the planks had these two prongs coming out. You put the socket to keep it secure. There's all the various partitions on uh, separating the Holy of Holies from the Holy, and which is the various names given for the Tent of Meaning, it's also called. It's the actual Mishnah itself. It was broken down to, in the Holy of Holies was the Ark, and then there was a partition between that and what's called the Holy or the Kodesh, which had the menorah and the incense, uh, Mizbeach, the altar of the incense, and it had also the table. Those three were in that intermediary section. There's another uh, curtain partition separating that, and then the rest of the, also as the, uh, as well as the chatzer, the courtyard of the, of the, of the, of the area in which you have the bigger altar and the key or and the washing basin. So they made all, all the partitions and the screens. Uh, Betzalel, along with his helpers, he makes the ark with exact details as we talked about uh, several weeks ago. Uh, the ark has a cover on which there's the two cherubs. You have the, you have the gold the golden ark with the golden cherubs on top with the poles that never come out. The table, like we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, a table on which you put the bread, the menorah, all the details of the menorah, everything they make, uh, the salam made, and lastly, the incense offering. That was the, the, those are the four vessels that are inside the actual walls of the tabernacle. So the ark, along with its cover, the table, the menorah, and the incense al- altar, a small golden altar. And then in chapter 38, it talks about the ele- what's known as the elevation offering, the Mizbah Ha'ola, which is another altar, but that's where you actually, they would actually burn the leftovers uh, from the sacrifice. We'll get the sacrifices a little bit in, in Leviticus. And they make that, that's outside of the actual Oomoed, of the uh, attentive offering. Again, done with all the details, all the vessels, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, the fire pans, all the copper vessels. This is made out of copper, but inside of it there's, uh, there's earth, there's rings to carry it. And in verse 8, it talks about making the kior, the water basin, and it's made out of the mirrors of the legions who massed at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Interesting here, the kior is made out of mirrors. Where do these mirrors come from? So Rashi gives us an amazing backstory here. When the Jewish people were in Egypt, they were enslaved, uh, yet they managed to procreate and to grow despite their challenges. And 
Rashi tells us that the daughters of Israel, so the Jewish women, they each they had a mirrors that they would use to beautify themselves, to make themselves, you know, to make themselves more uh, more beautiful, and that would encourage, of course, the uh, natalism and uh, procreation, and so they come and they have their, everyone donating. Uh, and, Copper. Is there a call out for copper? And all these women show up with their mirrors. I want to donate the copper. And Moshe says, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if we should use these mirrors. Should be used. The mirrors that they use to evoke the Yetzirah, so to speak. These are the mirrors that should be put in the temple. Doesn't seem proper. And the mighty tells him, No, you accept these because these are the most beloved to me. Because through these mirrors, the Jewish women, they established legions, many legions of Jews in Egypt. And therefore, we'll make the tea or the water basin out of this because the water basin on the more esoteric level was there to ensure that there's marital peace between husband and wife. An amazing idea. Think about this. Moshe is there. He's fundraising. And he's calling out, and everyone's giving the gold and the silver, amazing generosity on the hands of the people. And then he makes a call out for copper. Why? For the kior. And all the women show up with their, with their mirrors. And Moshe says, I don't, I don't think this is appropriate. And God says, no. This is specifically what I want because this is really holy. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of really interesting ways to look at this. You know, perhaps we could even connect this to the broader idea of the, the Mishkan in general, the broader idea of the Mishkan is, well, you look at it and you, you look at the description, there's gold and there's going to be sacrifices. It seems like it's, it's something we can relate to and we see it on a very physical level. Yet we know, God tells us at the introduction of this whole, of this whole process, I will dwell here. So, like we've spoken about this in the past, the Mishkan, and the tabernacle and the temple is a touch point of two different worlds. Two different worlds are meeting. And yes, there's the physical component of it, but the physical component is being uplifted and becoming spiritual as well. And this is a broad idea that applies everywhere in, in Jewish life. You know, we look at the Yetzirah. Yetzirah is a force that is trying to disrupt our success in life. There's many sources on this. It's clearly an obstacle in our course through life. But the idea of holiness applies to it as well. The idea of taking the physical or something that can potentially be used uh, and to disregard the Almighty and using it to uplift it, to make it holy. And Moshe is saying, wait a minute, this is something that it has the Yetzirah. I don't want this over here in the temple. Temple's holy. And then I says, no, specifically this is what we're going to use because this is the kosher version of the Yetzirah. It's the Yetzirah that's used for a mitzvah. It's used for holiness. It's taking the mundane and making it holy. And thus, not only is it okay, it's specifically what I would prefer for the tabernacle. I think it's just a, like an, an amazing idea. The Talmud tells us that when the verse in Genesis tells us at the end of the description of creation, it says that the Almighty saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very, very good. It doesn't say it was good, it says it was very good. So, so, so the, uh, the Midrash tells us that when it says, if it would have said it was good, that would be a reference to the good inclination, to the Yetzir Tov. The fact that it says, Tov Me'od, very good, it's a referring to the Yetzir Ra which seems problematic. The Yetzirah, in its name, the evil inclination, is called bad. It's a bad inclination. How could a bad inclination be very good? So the Midrash explains, because if someone did not have that, they wouldn't get married, and they wouldn't build a house, and they wouldn't plant a vineyard. But, among, so what does that mean? It's a separate question. I wrote an essay on it, if you're interested. Um, what does that mean? Why, if we didn't have the Yetzirah, would we not want to build a house or get married. But either way, it, it does show 
that something that, generally speaking, is called bad, it has iterations of itself where it can become not just good, but very good. Moshe's looking at the mirrors and he sees Yetzera. It's bad. And the man tells him, no, no, no. In this context, it's Tov Mo'od. It's exceedingly good. And therefore, it's the choicest of what I want to use. I'm going to put it into the, into the, uh, into the key or into the Mishkan. And the first, the first parsha concludes with continuation of all the things that Moshe, that, that Bitzalel and his helpers made. The pillars, pillars that upheld the outer courtyard and the screens of the courtyard. Uh, thus concludes the parsha, where it um, really goes through the actual uh, building of the impl- implementation of the building of the courtyard and the mishkan, as we were told, uh, as Moshe was told in uh, in Parshas Teruma, the instruction. Now they have the implementation, and Bitzalel begins. Uh, he fulfills the instructions to build everything in the Mishkan, and we start again in this week's Parsha, in the next, the next Parsha, the second Parsha, Pekude, which means like the instructions, and again, Betzalel is going to oversee that, to build, to, to, to establish all the themes necessary for, for, the, uh, for the Kohanes, so the, 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 the priests, they're going to have all the things needed for them, like all their garments, for example, and that's going to be done as well with Betzalel and his people. Now, there's an interesting midrash here at the beginning, which does seem to answer one of the questions that we we presented earlier: why, why, why is there so much detail and repetition? Why do we need to be told and retold everything that was instructed and now it's finally being implemented? Why not just say Moshe did everything, Moshe and Mitzal and all the people did everything exactly like you could just reference earlier. Um, so the Midrash tells us that Moshe is a trustworthy person. Because everything that he did, all even though there's, and the beginning of this is Parsha does go through the volume of material needed for everything. And it's an astonishing amount of gold and silver. And everything's being delivered to Moshe's house. His pallets full of gold being brought to his house. And of course, there's the temptation to take a slice of the action. To, you know, take your take your due, your due. And the Torah is retelling us everything of this whole parsha to show Moshe's integrity, the fact that he was totally trustworthy. He didn't take a single, even a tiny little slice or sliver of it for himself. Everything was donated for the holy. Uh, for the holy uh, activities. There was a prime minister of Israel, Levi Yashtol, in the 60s. At the time, it still happens a little bit today, but the early development of the state of Israel, there was a lot of fundraising that the actual state did in the United States, where American Zionists would actually donate money in the form of bonds or just straight-up cash towards the state, the fledgling state, it could get on its feet. So Ben so not Ben Gurion, uh, Ben Gurion's successor, Levi Eshkol, he told all the ambassadors and all the all the people. He says, "Take a little bit of uh, of the bounty off the top, just to just skim a little bit. It's okay to skim." And then he invoked a verse. The verse tells us in the Torah, "Lo sachsom shor bedisho," which means there's a prohibition. If you have an animal that's working on your fields, plowing the field, you can't put a muzzle in it. Why? Because it's working for you to help build the, to help make the, the plant all the vegetables, and it can't, you have to allow it to partake in the actual vegetables. So that's what Levi Stroll said. He said, these people there, they're fundraising, they're helping us with, so to speak, you can't muzzle them. They have to be allowed to take a little, skim a little bit off the top. Uh, that's not the way Moshe did it. Uh, and in fact, the Midrash even tells us that when Moshe would go into the warehouse where all the gold is, he would take a special garment that didn't have any pockets in it. So no one could even say Moshe is coming there and he's and he's lining his his pockets with with 
all our tax money, you know, our our truma money for the temple. He would and he would go out of his way to show that, to show to show that this is money given for the uh, for the Mishkan. I'm not going to touch even a little bit. Um, and that's why it tells us all the details that everything that Moshe did precisely the way uh, he was instructed. So now it goes through at the beginning over here in verses 34 through 29. It goes through just the measurements of how men, how much gold and silver and other materials were collected. There's an interesting correlation brought here in verse 27. Verse 27 talks about how many talents of silver were needed for the sockets of the sanctuary. It's interesting, the sockets, they were, were told that every, every person made a donation. There was a, there was a head tax on everyone, a half a shekel. But there were also other parts of, uh, of the donations that were, whoever wants to give gives, whoever doesn't want to give doesn't have to give. But there were some things that were mandatory for everything, specifically the sockets of the planks, which is like the foundation of the Mishkan, that came out of the fund of, of the half shekel where everyone gave. And the idea is that everyone should contribute towards the foundational ideas. And we're told that there's a hundred talents of silver for the sockets. So one of the commentaries notes that this hundred talents of the silvers they correspond to the hundred daily blessings that every Jew needs. Maybe we spoke about this a couple of years ago, uh, that there's a hundred blessings that we're supposed to make every year, every day. And the commentaries note that the hundred talents of silver are somehow correlated. So the question is, of course, what, is that? what does that mean? What, what's the connection between the silver sockets for the planes and the hundred blessings that we make every day. And I think the answer is, is kind of a deep idea. And that is that our objective in life is to become a replica, so to speak, of the Mishkan. Like we said, the Mishkan is a touch point of the physical and spiritual worlds. We're physical, but we also have a spiritual element to ourselves, our soul. And our objective is to try to unearth that and make it a... a uh, a, a symbiotic relationship with our body and soul that are working together for God to make a place where in our hearts, so to speak, God could be, God, there could be a dwelling place for God in our hearts. And the foundation of that is a blessing. A blessing is something where I'm bringing, I'm, I'm having a fruit or a drink of water. It's a physical activity. And what do I do? I blanket with it with spirituality with a mitzvah, with a blessing, and I'm invoking God. And thus, this is, the, so to speak, the foundation where the daily reminders of bringing God into our world with the blessing, that is the underpinnings of our internal mishkan. And therefore, there is this idea that they're connected with the sockets, that they, just like the sockets came from everyone, everyone had to contribute, everyone has to do 100 blessings, and on top of that, we have to kind of go on our own. But there's the structure that allows us to build a framework for making our hearts also a place where it's hospitable for God. It's a very interesting idea, I think, that does bring this whole discussion to make it more relevant to us. Now, chapter 38 here, it, uh, in verse, verse number one, it ends off that they, they fundraised all the stuff as Hashem commanded Moshe. And I actually counted how many times does that, those words, as Hashem commanded, Ka'asher tziva Hashem is Moshe, like Hashem co- commanded Moshe. In this parsha, Bikude, it actually appears 17 times, an astonishing amount of times. It, uh, after everything they did, it, 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 it ends with Kasher Tziva Hashem as Moshe. And the question is, like, why, why are we emphasizing? It could very simply, like, like we said, the Torah does not want to tell us anything that's extra. It could have just ended up the whole parsha, list all the things that they made, and said all this was done in accordance to the way the Almighty instructed Moshe. 
it after every station, every stop, every juncture says, this was done like Hashem told Moshe. This is like Hashem told Moshe. This again repeats it again and again. So what's the significance of that? So the base Halevi, one of the commentators in the Torah, he emphasizes that the critical sin that we mentioned earlier, the critical sin of the golden calf was not with the intentions. The intentions were were just. They had a they, they had a leader who was provided so much guidance. He's gone in their minds, and it it made sense. It's good intentions to say, let's try to find a replacement. That wasn't their problem. The problem was that their actions were against God. God said, don't make any images, and they made images. And they thought they're smarter. They, they thought that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to outthink God, and I'll, I'll do something because of my, let, me, let my intentions override what the Almighty actually said, because my intentions are so noble. And the intentions were noble, but we see the lesson is that we have to do, intentions are critical, but the behavior has to be in line with what the Almighty tells us. And even though we can't say that let's take our intentions and deviate off the path of God. Now, the building of the Mishkan is done to rectify the sin of the golden calf. And the Satora stresses again and again and again. Everything that Moshe did was because the Almighty told him to do it. And it repeats it, and repeats it, and repeats it to show that this is coming to counteract what had previously been on display, where people do things because they feel inspired, they feel this is the correct way to behave, and that's what they just, they just do it, and they, irrespective of whether or not those actions are actually ones that the Almighty instructed them to do. And by invoking this again and again, we, we're teaching us that this is coming to fix the golden calf. Uh, we're told again in the, in the Talmud that there's the golden calf and then there's the cow or heifer that appears a little bit later, the red heifer. And the Midrash gives us an example of how these two are related. So they're both a calf is a small cow. How are these possi- How are these related? So you have the the child. The child comes to the neighbor's house and takes the sandwich and smashes it into the floor and takes the crayons and colors over the walls and makes a huge mess. And what happens? The mother comes and cleans up after them. So you have the golden calf, the baby cow. It comes and it makes a huge mess in the whole Jewish people. Comes along the mother, the red heifer, and she's going to clean up the mess after them. That's what the Midrash tells us. That, that, that's there to fix it. And indeed, if you look at it like on a, a deeper level, the sin of the golden calf, the intentions were amazing. They really had great ideas of how to solve their problem, but they deviated from what God said. The, gold, the red heifer, it's the one mitzvah that we cannot understand the intentions. We're doing it solely because God told us to do it. And thus, it directly connects to the actual mistake. It's not just some nice idea that uh, we have the mother cow and the baby cow, let's clean up the mess. It actually gets to the heart of the issue. The Jewish people initially, they said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do what God wants, I'm gonna do what, I, I'm gonna do what I think makes sense because of my intention. And now we're told, no, you do only what God wants and you don't even understand why. You, the, you can't even wrap, wrap your head around the intentions because that is the way you fix the sense. You condition yourself to uh, to listen to Hashem just because He said so. You don't understand it. He told you to do it, and that's what you should do. And thus, the Torah invokes this already at the already right in the aftermath of the golden calf, again and again and again, like Hashem told Moshe. So let's go through them real quickly here. The aphod again. That's the it's it's like an apron like with the belt, with the stones, the breastplate, the choshen with the weaver's craft, like the workmen of the, the aphode, um, all the settings and the rings, everything connected really nicely. Um, all the tunics, the headplate that sits, 
Finally, everything is done. They bring the tabernacle to Moshe. He inspects it from top to bottom. Again, it goes through a list of all the various parts of the uh, tabernacle, everything, all the details, all the vestments. And finally, Moshe approves. He says everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, the Jewish people did precisely what the, the way they were instructed to do. Moshe saw the work, and behold, they had done it exactly as Hashem had commanded, exactly as Hashem had commanded, so they had done it, and Moshe blessed them. And the Parsha, and indeed the book, is going to end where Hashem is going to instruct Moshe to actually build it for the first time. Now you have all the parts built, now actually assemble it. And the way it's actually going to work is that there's going to be seven days before the first day of Nisan. So you have the beginning of it is on Yom, the day after Yom Kippur, so right before Pesach, right before Sukkot, on the eleventh day of Tishrei, and then it's going to be ready the first day of Nisan. So chapter forty starts off on the first day of the month. On the first month, you erect erect the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. So what's the first month? The first month is Nisan. So you have Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kislev, Teves, Shvat, Adar, and then Nisan. And it's, uh, so it's about um, a little bit less than six months, six whole months. That's when it's going to be finally finished, and they're actually going to uh, erect it for the first time. So what they actually did, a week beforehand, it was actually ready. The week, of, the week beforehand was the inauguration week. And for that week, Moshe was the high priest. Moshe, remember, Moshe initially was supposed to be the priest, and it was demoted, and he had to give his status to Aaron. For that week, Moshe was the high priest, and for seven days straight, Moshe himself assembled and disassembled the Mishkan every day and did work in the Mishkan. And we know over the course of the next, uh, the rest of the Torah, the Jewish people are going to be traveling a lot. And every place they go, the first thing they do is reassemble the Mishkan in their new dwelling place. When they're ready to leave, everyone has their job, but everyone takes their, everyone has their parts. And they disassemble the Mishkan and they put it in their wagons and they keep on going. So now Moshe is going to erect it and disassemble it for seven days. And then finally he's going to establish it on the first day of the month, on the first day of Nisan, and everything is going to be done. Again, it goes through everything. It goes through, it goes, it goes, it lists again the locations of all the different of all the different vessels. The instruction to anoint it, like we saw in recent weeks, that there's this special anointment oil. You got to pour all of, over all these vessels to to consecrate them. And Aaron and his sons are going to be consecrated as well. They're dressed in the holy vestments. They're anointed. They're sanctified, and they're ready to go. And finally, it was the first day of the month, the second year. So basically, basically, it's around. A, Two weeks shy of a year after they left Egypt, everything is built, everything is established, everything is ready to go. They put all, they actually erect it, they put the, uh, t- they erect the tabernacle with all the covers, with the ark, they put the ark in the Kodesh HaKadashim, in, uh, covered by the partition, they place a table and the, and the menorah and the golden altar, alternatively called the incense altar, in the tent of meeting in the Mishkan. They have another curtain. They put the, uh, it's going from the in sort to out. So they put the ark and then the, uh, and then the table and the menorah and then the altar. Another curtain. The kior, the basin, and the big altar. Everything is erected. And finally, the parsha ends with the cloud now covers it. As everything was completed, this cloud of <clears throat> God's, of God's presence uh, begins to cover the entire area. The glory of Hashem fulfill, uh, filled the tabernacle, and even Moshe didn't want to go in until he was invited to come in. Even though he himself had invested so much time and effort to do it, Moshe. This is one of Moshe's uh, hallmarks: is that even though he had the rights to come in, he was, didn't come until he was invited. And this cloud would be their guide for when it's time to move. Whenever the cloud lifts up and starts heading out, everyone quickly disassembles the Mishkan and starts following the cloud wherever it's going to take them. And thus concludes the Parshas, and thus concludes the book, the book of Exodus. It's a fantastic 
uh, transformation. We started off the book, we were slaves. We quickly became slaves in the, in the very first chapter of the book of Exodus. Second chapter, we meet Moshe uh, with miraculous uh, events and happenings. He ends up growing up in the house of Pharaoh, and he achieves greatness. He has to escape, and he is ushered back to Egypt by God, unwillingly at first, of course. He, uh, the Almighty, unleashes tremendous plagues upon Egypt, humbling them and severely uh, diminishing them and, again, transferring the Jewish people's allegiance from Pharaoh to God. Finally, they have the Exodus after all the plagues. They leave, they're splitting the sea along the way. Ten Commandments, they reach the acme of human achievement. Unbelievable. Jewish, the Jewish people themselves, they're alive and they're hearing God prophecy. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't last very long. It comes to a crashing, crashing halt. Uh, but before that, we get Parshas Mishpatim, uh, all the laws of interpersonal. Right after we have the Ten Commandments, we're right away thrust into interpersonal laws. It's important for us to realize that we have this balance in our lives. So we can't just be uh, be righteous to God with the righteous to our fellow man as well. Uh, in, before we're told the details of the golden calf, we have the two parshas that taught, tell us about the tabernacle and the vestments of the high priest, respectively, the story of the golden calf, the devastation, and the reclamation project. And finally, at the end of this, we have the cloud of Hashem, the very last paragraph, the cloud of Hashem is there above the Jewish people and above the tabernacle. This is, uh, we are, we have achieved our destiny. Pretty remarkable. I want to show everyone here. We have some extra time here. There's uh, an amazing midrash here in this this parsha that makes a connection, a curious connection. It's not really relative to the actual flow of the parsha. It's more like an idea, a broader idea. It makes a connection between three themes, and it does it does it textually and also does it conceptually. And the text is that three verses that talk about the Almighty creating something with wisdom, or creating an entity with wisdom. And one verse is that Hashem created the world with wisdom. And another is that Hashem created a man, Asher Yatzaris Adam B'Chachman. God created man with wisdom. And the world and man is created with wisdom. And the verse, the Midrash tells us that man is his mini-world. Many, interesting idea. And lastly, the Mishkan was also created with wisdom. That uh, that Salah had wisdom that given to him from God to create the Mishkan, and it makes an, a very curious connection here between the formation of the world and of man and of the Mishkan, as if these three are are, are different dimensions of the same thing. I just want to share a little bit over here because I think it's it, it's it is relevant to the parsha, and of course it's relevant to us as well. When Hashem created the world, He created it like the way a child is developed in gestation. Just like a child, it starts off with the umbilical cord. Like if you look at pictures of a of a of an embryo that's a few months, a few a few a few weeks old, there's this huge umbilical cord, this tiny little 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 nub, little bit, and then it gets stretched out from there. First, it has this pipeline of energy and vitality, and then you could stretch it out from, from there. So, too, when they might created the world, he created it first from the Evan Shesia, the foundation stone. The foundation stone is at the epicenter of Temple Mount. There's a stone. Many have suggested that the, te- the Dome of the Rock, or Dome of the Stone, is that same stone. It's this massive stone at the crux of the spiritual world. And we're told that, and by the way, the, this midrash was written before the Muslims were ever invented. Important to note that. That is the foundation stone of the world. It's the first stone that they might have used to create the world, and then everything else was stretched out from there. But we're told here that this is com- comparable to an umbilical cord, just like the world was stretched out of it, so too, uh, so the, well, it's just like a child is stretched out of the umbilical cord, like that's where it starts and everything expands out from there, 
so to the world, it starts where the temple was, and it was stretched out from there. That's what the Midrash tells us. And I think the idea is that just like, the, the comparison is, 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 uh, is important here. The umbilical cord is what gives life to the child. The child on its own cannot exist independently. It's, it's dependent. Our world is also dependent. It's dependent on God. And where is this, so to speak, cord where the spiritual world is infusing life into the physical world? That is in Temple Mount, and that is personified, of course, by the third thing, which is the Mishkan. These are all the same thing because everything that's physical has to have spiritual life pumped into it or else it doesn't exist. It cannot exist independent of God. God is the only thing that's independent. Everything else is dependent upon him. So this is a very powerful idea of what, what are we describing here? When we read, we've spent four parshas, four and a half parshas talking about the Mishkan. The Torah is laboring this idea, belaboring it. It's stressing it again and again. And here we see this just core idea brought down in the Midrash that this is the pipeline with which all vitality is given to this world. Now, of course, nowadays, we don't have a temple. So where does that come from? Where's the replacement for the temple? That's Torah study, as the Talmud says. Once the temple's destroyed, the Almighty has only one place in the world. That's the four cubits of Torah study. Torah study is what's drawing the vitality to this world. Thus, the Talmud says, if, he, if there's for even one second, there's no one studying Torah, the world stops to exist because it loses its power source and that's it. We're back to being uh, nothingness. It's just an incredible idea and, that, and that's the human. The human, we now have to take the role for ourselves. We are going to be a replacement for the tabernacle because we're the ones who are bringing life and existence and vitality to the world. How? With our portable touch point to worlds. A Torah that is from heavens. Moshe goes up to heavens, argues with angels to bring us the Torah. And so we have another touch point here. And that is a pipe that's drawing all the goodness from the spiritual world into our world. It's a very powerful idea that does, I think, bring this, I think, closer to us, but also impresses upon us our responsibility. Now, there's no temple, there's no tabernacle. It played a vital role. We have to be that umbilical cord uh, to bring spiritual power into this world.